homeschool parents. Have you been searching online at your state's educational standards and you feel a little overwhelmed? Maybe you're reading tons of teacher jargon and you're just unsure what they mean by each standard. Stick around, this video is for you. Now, I see many of you asking in some of the online groups, what about my state standards? Or I've printed off my state standards for this grade level for my child, and I plan to teach them. I'm just a little overwhelmed. Well, I would say that's pretty normal. I cannot even imagine where you're coming from, especially if you've never had to really use the standards before. Now, when I was a teacher in the schools, I did use these standards. I knew what they meant had to be accountable for teaching them. However, when I transitioned to become a homeschool parent, and I was starting my child in kindergarten, I did go home and I printed off those kindergarten standards, but I ended up not looking at them all year long. It was just too overwhelming. I mean, some of the ways that they word the standards are confusing, first of all. And second of all, I had so many other things to do. I had a new baby in the house. I had things to take care of. I had food to cook. I had things to clean. Homeschooling my child was not my only responsibility, and I wasn't getting paid to sit there and look through all the standards as I was when I was a teacher in the schools. So if you're the parent of an elementary age child or a middle school age child, I'm going to help simplify those standards for you today. Let's talk about reading first. How do you teach reading? Well, if your child cannot read yet, or if your child does not read well, maybe they need to fill in some learning gaps, I highly suggest purchasing a reading curriculum. There are so many to choose from. You're gonna to wanna to get one that definitely teaches rules of phonics, one that has just excellent reviews. The price may scare you away a little at first, but keep in mind, sometimes you can resell the curriculum when you are done, particularly if it's not a workbook that your child works in. And several reading curriculums have hands-on materials that as long as you take good care of them, they are totally able to resell and earn some of your money back. If your child already reads, you may not choose to purchase a reading curriculum. I haven't purchased a reading curriculum in several years. So my main goal was to get my child to read. Once they were able to read, we continued reading by picking more and more difficult books, longer and longer books. We would get chapter books that we might read together, a chapter book I might read aloud to him. We would also get nonfiction books, and there you could work in your science and social studies. That's up to you whether or not you want to purchase a curriculum. If you do have a reader, I was able to get by not doing so and just discussing what my child was reading. If a figure of speech came up or a word he didn't know, new vocabulary, we were able to work in all those things as well as predicting. And I just didn't feel like it was needed for my family. You might choose to do that as well. Now, I didn't buy tons of books for my children to read. I did go to the library a lot, though. So make sure you are familiar with your local library. See if you're able to reserve books online. Maybe you even want to use their pickup service. During the pandemic, I was able to use our local library, request the books on there, and they would have a bag ready for me to pick up, just like I was doing at the grocery store. So that came in very handy, as well as just not having to buy the books. Just use them for a while and then return them. Now, I want to say a little something about reading aloud. Read aloud to your child, even if he is in elementary or middle school. Reading aloud to your child is going to provide a calming, quiet part of the day. You might allow your child to rest, play with Legos, draw a picture while they are listening, and you're going to want to stop and have conversations with them about what you are reading. Predict what do you think will happen next? Why do you think that person said that? Would you have said that if that were you? What do you think that word means? You're engaging in conversation with your child, and every time your child opens their mouth to speak, it lets you know what their level of understanding is. The whole goal in education is 
to learn, to learn to read. Once you know how to read, you can learn to do a million other things. So if you're reading aloud to your child, it provides a special opportunity, a way of assessing to what degree your child does really understand things. And you are modeling for your child what good reading looks like and what good reading sounds like. You might read a newspaper. You might read a chapter book. You might read an article or something that is history-based or science-based. Just keep reading and read aloud daily. Hi parents, is your child struggling to read or even hates to read? Nothing you have tried has worked? Get my free guide, Five Quick Tips to Immediately Help Your Struggling Reader. I'm gonna show you the simple tricks that I've used for years to successfully improve children's reading and their confidence in reading. It's easy, it's simple, and it's free. Just go to theparentteacherbridge.com slash reading help. You can find that link in the description below. Let's talk about writing and language arts. Now I would definitely suggest purchasing a curriculum to make it easier for you and to give some structure once your child has hit third grade. It might be a program that includes how to write a paragraph or how to write essays. And it also should include the parts of speech and the parts of sentences. But prior to third grade, you can take care of writing with just the use of a simple journal. Now I have another video about how I've used primary journals with my own children in homeschooling. But when they are first learning to write, they might just be copying a word of something they drew. You might give them a sentence and they practice copying the sentence so they see what a good sentence looks like. Or you might read a sentence to them and have them write it out before they are ready to actually write their own stories and their own sentences. The best way you're going to know how a child does on their handwriting or their spelling is to just look at the work that they produce. So whether that be a journal where it's all bound together or whether you have them write a special paper or a special project, that's going to show you what their strengths and weaknesses are. And if you're looking for ideas on grading writing, look into writing rubrics, R-U-B-R-I-C-S. And those are basically just checklists that you can use to gauge your child's writing according to their grade level. Let's talk about math. As with reading and writing, it is good for you to do math with your child every single day so that they don't slip back on their skills. I recommend having a curriculum because it will save you time from having to search for new ideas or to have to print things off. A curriculum might come with lots of hands-on games. If you see that fitting for you, fine. A curriculum might come with videos that your child watches online that helps teach the idea or a curriculum may come in a workbook form. Whatever you choose, there is no perfect curriculum, and I assure you that whatever curriculum that teachers are using in public schools may not even be their first pick, and it may not even fit the state standards perfectly, although they will be sure to put that on the front of their book that they do. I never had a textbook when I was a teacher that I chose. Whenever they would ask teachers, what do you think? Which textbook do you like the best? And we would fill out a little form and we would vote for our favorite. When it came time to adopt textbooks, my favorite was never the one that we adopted. So teachers had to make the most of what they had. In other words, you can make the most with what you've got, even if you can't afford to buy the most expensive curriculum out there. But I do recommend getting one, whether it's online or whether it comes in a book. Times that I've been between curriculum, it has been difficult for me to sit down at my computer, find something that is the skill I exactly want, and then print it off and know that I have printer and know that I have paper ready to do that. It takes so much guesswork out of it if you just get a curriculum. It doesn't have to be perfect. Just do math every day and make sure your child is learning. If you choose the online option, be sure that your child is still getting practice writing the numbers down. So if they have to add a three-digit number and a three-digit number, allow them to practice writing it on their paper because you never really know when your child will have to go back to school. 
you may be planning to send, send your child back next year and you don't want them to lose some of these skills like writing neatly on a piece of paper, especially in math where it matters so much about whether or not you get the right answer. Science and social studies. So if you have a child that is in upper elementary or middle school, you might want to glance at the state standards and just see what topics come up. You know, are they studying World War II or are they studying ancient civilizations? Just by knowing some of those topics, it can help guide you through that process. If you have an older student and you want to purchase a textbook, you can do that and you can probably resell it again to offset the cost of that. But for younger children, you may not get around to teaching science and social studies, especially on a daily basis. So how might you handle that? Well, let's think about reading. You want to read aloud to your child. You want your child to have chances uh, to read lots of different types of books. So addressing science and social studies through the choice of your library books is a wonderful way to acquaint your child with science and social studies concepts, the special vocabulary that they are going to learn about every topic, the pictures that they will see in the books. You can also take virtual field trips online. You can write about it. You can draw about it. You can fold paper and make a miniature book about it. And besides all that, you have websites like Teachers Pay Teachers where you can print off a unit. But I would not go itemize through every single standard. That just sounds like a headache to me, especially for the younger grades. They are going to learn plenty about science and social studies if you just expose them to the books, maybe some kid documentaries about it, and you are talking that language and using that vocabulary. If you're a science person and you want to do an experiment with your child, you can subscribe to programs that do that. You can visit Pinterest and get some ideas. Even doing one science experiment per month is better than nothing. Your children will remember it. I'm terrible at doing science experiments. They just never come out quite right. But the other day, my son was reminding me about an experiment we had done about earthquakes. We poured sand and water into a box. We put little buildings on top, and then we shook it. We saw how the water came up to the surface. That's something that happens in the real world during an earthquake. That had been over a year and a half ago. And my, my now six-year-old still remembered it. So it doesn't have to get super fancy. Don't stress over science and social studies. Just get them exposed to these topics and learning the vocabulary. Now, I have made a list of all these different things that you can do with your child just from interacting with the library books that are science-based or social studies-based. And you can find a link in the description below for that. Or you can visit theparentteacherbridge.com slash homeschool projects. You might also be wondering about exploratory or specialty classes. Well, for PE, you definitely want your child to be physically active, but you might want to set a goal for them, whether that be riding a bike, lifting weights, running a mile, uh, playing a certain game, all of those count. You might get together with other friends and play some ball or take score on how many balls they shoot in the basket. All of that counts as PE. It is physical education. You might even decide to let them watch a workout video and dance along with it. What about music lessons? You could have your child take some music lessons. I know that there are plenty online. We actually go to someone's house for that, and I count that as part of my child's homeschooling music. He's also getting music theory in that as well. Your child might have an interest in studying a foreign language. You could add that to your homeschool plan. You might also just decide to explore your child's passion. You know, when you send your child to school, they're very limited in what they can do during that school day. It's determined by the teacher. It's not led by the student. But when you have your child at home, you can have a portion of the day for your child to explore their passion. And it very well may make the difference on what they decide to do for their career. Let's talk about grading. I know that some of you are watching this video and you may be living in a different state. 
That state may require you to report grades in a very specific way. Now, I use an umbrella school, which basically means they take care of reporting things to the state for me, but I must log in and I must list what my plan is for every subject that I'm teaching my child. And a couple times a year, I have to report grades. When my children are young, I usually use grades such as E for excellent or S for satisfactory, but I do plan to use numeric grades once they hit a certain age. It trains them to be more familiar with the way things are actually graded in schools and universities. Now, with that being said, what do you take a grade on? Well, let me give you a little background information here, and that is teachers don't grade everything. I remember when I was in the classroom, some of the older students when I taught sixth grade would ask, is this for a grade? which basically translated to, do I have to really try on this paper? <laughs> Are you really going to take a grade on it? Even in a regular classroom, the teacher may intend to take a grade on a particular assignment, and they may choose later after they see that the children didn't really do so well, and they feel like they didn't really teach it that well, they may decide to throw it out and not count it as a grade. So what I suggest for you as a parent, when you are determining what to take a grade on, you might choose to only grade a test or only grade once or twice a month or at the end of a unit. Because with multiple children learning multiple subjects and multiple grades just doesn't sound like fun to me and it sounds very stressful. So don't think that you have to have 20 different grades in one subject. Having just three or four might be enough to report to the state on how your child has done in that particular subject for that semester of the school year. Now, what other questions do you have as a new homeschooler? Please comment below. I would love to help you out. Remember, I have my guide for teaching science and social studies without a curriculum. You can find that at theparentteacherbridge.com slash homeschoolprojects. You can also find my free guide below in the description Five quick tips to immediately help your struggling reader. Check the Parent Teacher Bridge out on Facebook and Instagram. If you like this video, share it with a friend and click like and subscribe. Remember, you are your child's most influential teacher.